The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I was hit on my brakes real quick. A case of whiplash and an answer to prayer. It just was a miracle. Simple as that. Plus, from the streets. I can pull a gun out on you and make you do what I want you to do. To solitary. You had a whole lot of time to think. You knew you wasn't getting out. One inmate finds a way to survive. I experienced peace for the first time in my life. On today's 700 Club. Hey, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. In America today, unchecked federal judges are out of control. And in the process, they're damaging the democratic process. One judge, just one, can set policy for the entire nation. This is unconstitutional. It's wrong. I talked about it yesterday, and we've got experts to say we agree with what you're saying. We've got to control it. Wendy. Yeah, Pat, it's an unfortunate trend of the political scene in America, and it's one never envisioned by our founders. If a group loses the fight at the ballot box, they can just go to the courts. Paul Strand explains. For more than 150 years, only the U.S. Supreme Court made judicial rulings that could affect the whole country. Now these decisions with nationwide impact are coming more frequently from single judges or local federal courts. And voila, the whole country has to follow this one judge, this one person in this one district. It's outrageous. This is absolutely a recent phenomenon. Uh, for the first 150 years of our nation's judicial history, uh, this was unheard of. It, it simply wasn't even considered a, a possibility. National Affairs reporter John Fund told CBN News judges don't have this legal authority. The principle seems to be, I'll grab the power and if no one stops me, I'll keep using it. There's simply no uh, authority underlying it. The Heritage Foundation's Amy Swearer says such judges are moving outside the law. It seems to be completely inconsistent with the scope of the judicial power given to the federal courts through the Constitution. But it's gotten so bad, I think we really have to step forward and say, time out. These judges or courts have ruled against the Trump administration almost two dozen times. 23, and you know, it's early this morning, so there might be another one coming along that I haven't heard about. The latest situation involves the separation of children from their immigrant parents seeking asylum at the border. One judge not only ordered the Trump administration to reunite them, he's now ruled the nation can't deport those reunited families. The judge um, out west said, no, you can't do that. Swearer says opponents of President Trump's policies actually look for judges who will see things their way. It induces this forum shopping to try to find the right judge because as you hinted at, all it takes is one judge who disagrees with what could be hundreds of other judges. The Supreme Court can eventually overrule these judges, but it takes time for their rulings to make it to the high court. Oh, about 18 months, two years, if you're lucky. Swearer points out these matters that can affect national life should be decided by the people. It's not up for the individual courts and judges to decide, well, this is good policy, so therefore it must be constitutional. It's up to the people by and through their representatives. Supreme Court may be looking in the future for a case or may be looking for an opportunity to rule uh, this has gone too far. There you have it. Either the Supreme Court can rule on a case that would stop these individuals from speaking for the whole nation, or Congress can take action. A true balance of power as envisioned by our founders. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from outside U.S. District Court, Washington, D.C. Thanks, Paul. I've been talking about this uh, a number of times, and I'll say it again. The Constitution is clear. This, the, it established one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress will uh, from time to time designate. They are to set their powers, their jurisdiction, and all that. But unfortunately, we've got Congress that probably uh, enough Democrats to just love this thing. But the idea that somebody in Hawaii, in a little federal district court in Hawaii, is going to dictate to the entire nation how it's going to behave, this is outrageous. It is totally contrary to the Constitution. And Justice Thomas, for example, said it's unconstitutional. But what does it do? It leads to nothing but chaos because uh, these rulings will come. How do they? They shouldn't go from the district court to the Supreme Court because the, the issues aren't clearly delineated. 
the uh, participants aren't clearly uh, established. The law is not clearly set up. And what's normally uh, the case is the Supreme Court grants certiorari when there's a conflict of the circuit. So one circuit court, not a district court, but a circuit court, having heard an appeal from a district court, makes a ruling. Another uh, uh, circuit listens to the similar thing, but it's come up from a district court, and they make a ruling, and these rulings uh, conflict. At that point, there's a clash of the circuits, and the Supreme Court will grant cert, and they'll decide between the circuits. But the idea of the Supreme Court having to take a case directly from a district court is outrageous. Uh, it, it just is, is wrong. And I would say, n number one, Trump has the power, if he's so, or no, he doesn't have the power, but the Congress has the power uh, to say, look, two things, two things. The district court judge does not have any authority beyond the area in which his district is located. That's geographic. And the second thing, that he does not have power to rule on anybody who is not a litigant before him in a case uh, where both sides have representation. But the idea of an ex parte ruling, as they call it, that just reaches out across the nation and says, well, the drunk administration must do this, that, and the other. Well, I, I think, you know, you're not in contempt of court if you just ignore it. Because he's the president. And he can say, I will not accept that kind of a ruling, and I won't take it. But nevertheless, that may hurry the case. But to have these things go to the Supreme Court until they well, you use the term ripe, there's something really terribly wrong. And it's arrogance. The thing we need with, hum with judges is humility, judicial humility, not arrogance. Well, Democrats, if you can talk about an arrogance, they now want to subpoena the translator who was in the one-on-one -on -one meeting between uh, President uh, Trump and Vladimir Putin. And this, of course, is executive privilege and uh, is a violation of the constitutional prerogative of the president to set foreign policy. But nobody seems to want to listen to the Constitution anymore. They just want to do what they want to do. Well, John Jessup has more on that. Well, Pat, Democrats say they want to know exactly what President Trump and Vladimir Putin agreed to behind closed doors. The two-hour meeting wrapped up just minutes before the press conference that's created an uproar in Congress and the media. We need to have the president share with us what happened at that meeting. If he won't do it, then the interpreter should come, and we should make sure that we know what happened. Others are more direct, saying Congress should subpoena the translator to testify, as Pat was saying. Translators are bound by a code of ethics not to share privileged information. Lawmakers, though, say they're looking into the precedent of calling translators to testify. The president's team has not released details of the conversation between the two leaders. Republicans Bob Corker and Lindsey Graham want Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to brief the Senate Intelligence Committee on the meetings next week. Well, despite efforts to cut back on wasteful federal spending, a new report shows the pigs are still at the trough. CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson shows us some of this year's biggest projects charged to the American taxpayer. Republicans are supposedly the party of fiscal responsibility, yet the 2018 Congressional Pig Book shows that earmarks in pork barrel spending are dangerously on the rise and costing taxpayers billions. The cost of earmarks doubled in fiscal year 2018 from $6.8 billion to $14.7 billion. Americans thought the practice of lawmakers using federal funds for pet projects back home, like the infamous $398 million Alaska Bridge to Nowhere, ended in 2011. They're simply less transparent and more secretive. Rather than listing the names of the members of Congress, they just add a huge amount of money and then divide it up, probably behind closed doors, calling the agencies. This year's summary exposed things like $65 million for the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund and $13 million going to local museums, opera houses, and theaters. It is very frustrating. We need to do better for our taxpayers. Congressman Mark Walker says this practice leads to shady favors, a corrupt government, and wasteful spending. I find it, and I believe a lot of the people that I talk to in North Carolina, one of the most frustrating things is using the taxpayers' dollars to arrange deals or get things to vote one way or the other. That's what we've got to continue to improve on here in D.C. 
Some lawmakers want to lift the earmark ban to ease the gridlock of spending bills. But Senator Jeff Flake calls that a terrible idea. This notion that if you have a bunch of earmarks, you can speed the appropriations process uh, just doesn't wash. Uh, all it does is, is leverage more spending. It is the gateway drug to spending addiction. These lawmakers argue earmarks are the antithesis of draining the swamp, and they're fighting to see them banned once and for all. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abby. Pat, so much for draining the swamp. Yeah, well, I've got one that uh, you know, the, uh, ask their producer, give me some horribles. Well, uh, how about this? In Guam, there's what they call the brown snake. We don't have any of those in America, but they're in Guam, and they want to spend $865,000 to eradicate the brown snake uh, in Guam because they said they were introduced there by our soldiers in World War II. I mean, that's just one of the things. And uh, you go down the list, uh, you know, plant uh, eradication, swamp grass, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just crazy. They, they, that poor brown snake. It brown probably... snakes in Guam. We don't, <laughs> brown tree snake, they want to eradicate that rascal because our servicemen uh, introduced them during World War II. Uh, but I mean, it's just, you know, inc inc incredible. What they, they do, and it just is out of control. Somebody wants to spend some money, and they'll do it, you know. They had one for Lawrence Welk's birthplace. They wanted to build a monument to, because I, I like Lawrence Welk. I think he was a nice guy, but you're going to spend $400,000 to build a monument for not him. Not with my taxpayer money. Well, it, it, <laughs> the, it, it's like they're not spending your money. They're spending, it. well, it, it's the government's money, so everybody wants a little piece of the action. Well, I, I want to salute uh, Nikki Haley. She is absolutely brilliant. And uh, she is our ambassador to the UN, and John has a story about what she said. That's right, Pat. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley expanded on the decision to withdraw from the UN Human Rights Council. Haley told a standing room audience at the Heritage Foundation here in Washington that the Trump administration withdrew Tuesday because of the council's bias against Israel and its willingness to allow notorious human rights abusers as members. The Human Rights Council is the United Nations' greatest failure. It has taken the idea of human dignity, the idea that's at the center of our national creed and the birthright of every human being, and it has reduced it to just another instrument of international politics. Haley cited the admission of Congo as a member, even as mass graves were being discovered there. She also spoke about the failure to address human rights abuses in countries like Venezuela, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, adding that the United States will continue to fight for human rights in the future, just not from the Council. Well, a Turkish court has sent an American pastor accused of spying back to prison. Andrew Brunson's family, friends, and even the president had hoped he'd be released. But their expectations were dashed after a Wednesday hearing. Gary Lane brings us the details. It was the third hearing for the 50-year-old North Carolina pastor, and it ended in another disappointment. That's because many people thought Andrew Brunson would be freed from prison. He has spent 20 months behind Turkish bars, an accusation that he spied on the government and plotted with rebels to overthrow President Recep Tayyip Erdogan in July 2016. For nearly two hours during the hearing, former church members testified against Pastor Brunson, making vague, unsubstantiated accusations. When the judge asked Brunson to reply to the witnesses, he said, quote, My faith teaches me to forgive, so I forgive those who testified against me. Only one witness from the defense was allowed to testify. The U.S. government expressed concern about the court's decision. I have read the indictment. I have attended three hearings. Uh, I don't believe that there is any indication that Pastor Brunson is guilty of any sort of criminal or terrorist activity. The Trump administration and members of Congress have been pressuring Turkey to release the pastor. On Wednesday, President Trump expressed displeasure, tweeting, a total disgrace that Turkey will not release respected U.S. pastor Andrew Brunson from prison. He's been held hostage far too long. Erdogan should do something to free this wonderful Christian husband and father. He has done nothing wrong, and his family needs him. 
CeCe Heil of the American Center for Law and Justice says immediately after the court decision, the Trump administration and members of Congress began working again diplomatically to help free Brunson. It's a devastating blow. So I would just, you know, pray for encouragement um, for Pastor Brunson and, and for his family because they, they suffer the same. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Pat, Pastor Brunson now languishing in a Turkish prison for two years. You know, this Erdogan is really a thug. I, you know, we used to consider that Turkey was our strong ally. And uh, when there was an overthrow of the Sultan and the Ottoman Empire and so forth, Turkey became a secular democracy and has been a valued member of uh, NATO and other alliances. They have been, they were with us in Korea, for example, and other places, and their fighting men are exemplary. But Erdogan has decided he doesn't want a secular uh, democracy anymore. He wants a Muslim dictatorship with himself the dictator. Uh, he, he wants to be another sultan or whatever they call themselves. And they, they no longer should be a part of NATO. They should no longer be a part of the, the Western alliance against anybody because they're enemies of Israel, they're enemies of freedom, and uh, they're now the enemy of Christianity. And he spoke about the clash between uh, the mosque and the cross. And that clash is coming. But to arrest a man like Pastor Brunson, you know, up to this point, Turkey has been free. We. And if you go back and look at the Bible, you know, when the Paul, I mean, John writes about the churches of Asia, uh, you know, those Thyatira and all those churches, they're all in Turkey. That's all encompassed by what we now know as Turkey. And uh, it's a very important country, but for a time it was known as the sick man of Europe because they had so many problems. But um, what what we want to see now is is... I don't know what to do, but we certainly, uh, we can't give them any support anymore. But we have a big military air field at Incirlik in Turkey, and they can control the way we fly. And they were trying to do that during the Gulf War, is to uh, tell our people we couldn't fly in a certain area because uh, they were coming out of their an air field in their country. I think it's time we, we redeploy that and get out of Turkey and begin to bring the sanctions against them that we have applied against other dictators. Well, so much for that, Wendy. Yeah, it's really frustrating because it seems like there's something that could be done and it's well, just not happening. You've got a dictator, yeah. a Muslim dictator. There's nothing you can do right now except... Yeah, to pray. You know, Keep pray praying. And God and can do it. Put sanctions on them. All right. Amen. Well, coming up, the gang bringing the good news to the embattled city of Detroit. We want to see their lives radically transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See how this unique ministry is changing a community when we come back. Well, thank you. You're watching The 700 Club. We're so happy to have you with us. After fighting back from bankruptcy, the Motor City is on the road to recovery. And most of the credit, of course, goes to government officials and business executives. Still, the neighborhood leaders in Detroit are the ones who have made the true difference. Mark Martin shows us how an inner city ministry known as the Good News Gang is helping remake Motown. Revitalizing a major metro area like Detroit takes time. While you will see beautiful remodeled homes in some neighborhoods, Others only offer dilapidated buildings, piles of trash, and empty streets. Still recovering from its 2013 bankruptcy, this city built for nearly 2 million residents now has less than 700,000. In the Motown area showing signs of life, you'll likely find this man as a literal driving force. Pastor Matt Cripps of Metro Life Church wants these pockets of life to grow in the right way. That's why he and his team of bus drivers head to inner city neighborhoods known for drugs, violence, and gangs to show kids a different way of life. 
At Metro Life Church, they call their fleet of 10 buses soul winning machines. They travel throughout the Detroit area, picking up children to be a part of the Good News Gang. Good morning. What's up, John? What's up, young lady? How are you? What's up, sweet lady? Morning. You can't smile. There you go. All right. It often takes a little prodding to get kids out and on the bus, especially on a cool, rainy Saturday morning. But to this pastor and his volunteers, it's definitely worth it. We want to see their lives radically transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And throughout the week, we're knocking on their doors. We're praying with their families. We're inviting them to Good News Gang. And most importantly, we're, we're establishing relationship. That's the most important thing, is that they see Jesus in us. Because for most of them, for most of these children, we're the only Jesus they'll ever, ever know. CBN News spoke with parents at a couple of the bus stops. L.C. Wilson's children have been part of the Good News Gang for five years. Pastor Matt have a, a nice way of working with the children. And I mean, I had a great experience when I was with Pastor Matt. So I just feel like <laughs> it's, it's a, a fun and a good experience to get the children out on Saturdays and away from all of the violence and crime that's in the neighborhood. At first, Edward and Charlita Martin took a little flack for taking part. Like when I first met Pastor Mac, right, laid down the street was like, you let your kids go on the bus with them? You know, that's a white man, right? I said, that don't have anything to do with it. He's a godly man. That's what I look at. I look at the godliness. I don't care about what color you are. That don't have anything to do with, with church, Christ, and Jesus, because we are the same in the eyes of God. Back at the church, the kids file into a huge room with prizes and fun activities like a dance contest. Good News Gang averages more than 200 children each weekend. While they enjoy the fun and games, the main focus is sharing the gospel. On this day, they showed a Superbook video on the Tower of Babel and the Day of Pentecost. Afterwards, CBN Field Ministry Rep Ken Shad, who is also a children's pastor, led the kids in a salvation prayer to receive Jesus as their Savior. If you really believe what you just said, you're ready for resurrection power. And I want you to repeat after me, Jesus, Jesus. give me resurrection power. Following the prayer time, Pastor Matt talked about the importance of getting good grades in school. How did you get to go to the A and B party? From getting A's and B's on my report card. Then they finished up with a prize giveaway and pizza. Children ages 4 to 12 take part in the Good News Gang every Saturday. Pastor Matt has been leading the ministry for nearly 20 years. I just uh, want everyone to know that uh, we love Jesus. That's our motivation, is to share the love of Jesus to the city of Detroit, a city that's labeled as hopeless and everyone has written off, but we know God has not written these people off. He has a plan and a purpose for their lives, and he uses his church to bring that hope to these people, to these families. I think all of my friends and any other kids that see this should come here. It's fun, you'll have a good time, you'll learn about the Lord, and all together it's just really fun. And my favorite thing about Good News Game, Good News Game is worshiping God and learning great things about Him. Pastor Matt says they have a saying that they want the kids to experience heaven at Good News Gang, heaven away from tough situations at home. Many of them come from homes that are filled with despair and hopelessness, but we know that through Jesus Christ there is hope. And everyone said amen. amen. Mark Martin, CBN News, Detroit. Instead of Motor City, maybe they ought to call it Phoenix out of the ashes, you know, <laughs> is arising something very nice. I congratulate uh, Detroit and Pastor. Uh, that's good Good news. Good you know, news. You just feel, I just feel better after watching that story. Uh, I mean, you do yeah, feel the good news. Right. Definitely, it's contagious. Well, up next, a man struggles to survive behind bars. Murderers, rapists, pedophiles, people that prey on weaknesses. You can't go up in there being soft and nice, just can't. So it got to a point where in order for me to survive again, I had to fight. See how fighting lands this prisoner in solitary where he hears a voice that sets him free.
Imagine, imagine that you're a little boy, you're 12 years old, and you've got no place to live. And nobody cares, nobody loves you. Well, that's the way it was with Richard Horner. He was forced to rob and steal just to stay alive. That one day, after being imprisoned and then put because of fighting in solitary confinement, Richard heard a voice. And for the first time in his life, somebody loved him. Whatever I had to do to survive is what I was willing to do during those times. At 12 years old, Richard Horn was left on his own to run the callous streets of Detroit, Michigan. He only knew abuse and rejection from his alcoholic father and uncaring mother. I didn't know what love was. I didn't even understand when somebody said, I love you. I didn't trust them because, you know, the one minute they say they love you, the next minute they leave you. After his parents divorced, Richard chose the streets rather than stay with his father. He spent his teen years either living in abandoned homes or locked up in juvenile detention. I was always robbing someone, snatching purses, stealing cars, breaking into houses, stealing from grocery stores. I didn't see a future. I just saw today. Over time, it became more than survival. I felt as if now I have a voice. You know, I could pull a gun out on you and make you do what I want you to do. At 17, Richard was arrested and convicted on 11 counts of armed robbery. This time, he was tried as an adult and received five years in a state penitentiary. Murderers, rapists, pedophiles, people that prey on weaknesses. You can't go up in there being soft and nice, just can't. So it got to a point where in order for me to survive again, I had to fight. But fighting landed Richard in solitary confinement. You had a whole lot of time to think, to sit back and just contemplate on what's the next steps. What is it that you can do to better yourself or your circumstances? You knew you wasn't getting out, but it was possible that you could make this home a little better for you. As days turned into weeks, Richard was losing his fight. It got to a point where it became tiresome to survive and you wanted to have more out of life. I was tired of being frustrated and I was tired of being uh, locked up. I was tired of feeling like an animal. It was then one of the inmates who worked in solitary began striking up conversations with Richard. He would constantly come talk to me about Christ. He would pray to me about Christ. He would offer me to come to uh, Bible study. Richard accepted his invitations to go to the church services, if nothing else, to escape solitary confinement. But something was happening. I mean, I was being led by a positive force when I was used to always being led by something negative. I guess I felt love, and it just grew on me. It's just, I can't really explain it. It's just it's like a transforming of my mind and my heart. Encouraged, Richard also started praying and reading the Bible, hoping that God had a purpose for him. One evening in March of 1989, he realized he needed to ask God to help him change his life. I was tired of the uh, same uh, monotonous, uh, defeating, non-purposeful life. And when I went in my cell that night, I had prayed, and I heard God say to me that I, that I was his son. It was an audible voice I heard. For the first time in my life, I felt as if someone really cared about me. The next day, Richard went to the church service. They did the salvation call, and I just got up and went up there and gave my life to Christ. You know, the Word of God says He'll give us a peace that transcends all understanding. I experienced peace for the first time in my life, and I wanted more of it. Once I gave my life to Christ, I surely was challenged to make better decisions, to spend time with God and, and you know, reading my word, uh, finding ways to love on people and not hurt people. Richard served his five years and was released in October 1991 at 23 years old. Within months, he had started his own home improvement business and met his wife, Renda. 
I knew that I wanted to do better, and I knew that I wanted to have a family. And I had prayed to God all the time that I was incarcerated. Uh, I say, God, if you ever give me a wife and a children, that I always love them and I'll never leave them. Since then, they've raised seven children. The youngest is still home. Each day, Richard is reminded of how faith in Christ gave him purpose and hope for a new life. When I found Christ, from the very first day, he's never left me. He's always been there. I've always had someone to talk to. I've always got positive uh, guidance, steered in the right direction. It was a song, uh, the, you made something beautiful out of my life. Can you imagine somebody as wrecked as Richard was, no parents who loved him, never loved as a child, out homeless when he's just 12 years old, forced to fight when he got to prison because the bad guys were there and he had to fight to survive. And then because of the fact he fought to defend himself, he's put in solitary. His life is shattered, shattered. But you know, God just took the pieces, each little piece, and he put it together. And he put Richard's life together. He served his sentence. But the thing was, he was a new creature because the Lord had remade him. And all of that brokenness from the past was put together. And that's what he can do for you. He can take the pieces of your life and he can make something beautiful out of it. You've been smashed. You've been hurt. You've been abandoned. You haven't been loved. You've had a bad home life. You had a bad marriage. You've had a bad business situation. You've had a lot of things. People have just been terrible to you. But the Lord can take all those hurts and all of those failures and all those sins and all the bad stuff and make something wonderful. And what he offers to you right now, again, the Lord says if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Do you want to be new? Do you want to be fresh? You know, Richard, the first time in his life he felt peace. He'd never known peace. There's a war going on inside of many of you. There's just fighting all the time, this terrible anguish because you're away from your father's house. And I want to invite you right now. The father is talking to you and saying, child, I love you. I'm going to make something wonderful out of you. I'm going to make you beyond anything you could imagine, whatever you could, something better than you can ask or think. But what do you do? Well, you start by asking Jesus to take over. So pray with me right now. Let's do that. And then we can get on something else. Bow your head, pray these words, meet them in your heart, and pray these words, Lord Jesus. That's right. Lord Jesus, you know what's been done to me. You know how I've been hurt. You know how the pieces have been scattered and I have been broken. But Lord, I come to you now with a broken heart and I ask you to please put it together. I give you my life. I give you the pieces of my life. And I ask, Lord, that you will make something beautiful out of it. Take me, Lord. I receive you as my Savior, and from this moment on, I am yours. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to give you something. It'll help you. It's a little packet. It's got a book with it. It's got a little CD in here. I'll give this to you. It's called A New Day. Uh, all you got to do is call in. There's no money involved whatsoever. Nobody's going to ask you for any money. But if you, if you don't want to call, that's, that's fine. But I, I just want you to call in and say, look, I gave my heart to the Lord. And if you don't want to give us your name, that's fine too. But there's a telephone number. It's a toll-free number. It's 800-700-7000. 800-700-7000. All right? And you say, I pray with Pat, and I want that little book called A New Day. And I right now am a new creature in Christ. Wendy, 
Thanks, Pat. Still to come, we've got your email questions. Kevin says, I am confused regarding President Trump. So many Christians put down the president. Aren't we supposed to pray for our leaders? We'll tackle that and much more coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is trying to clarify his controversial comments about Holocaust deniers. During an interview, Zuckerberg is quoted saying some deniers who post on Facebook aren't intentionally getting it wrong. Zuckerberg saying Facebook allows conspiracy theories to remain on site and compared them to people who simply misspeak. His comments drew immediate criticism. Now in a follow-up statement, Zuckerberg says he personally finds Holocaust deniers deeply offensive and says he did not mean to offend anyone. California voters aren't allowed to decide if they should split their state into three. The Cal 3 initiative proposes splitting the state into Northern California, California, and Southern California. It had gained enough signatures in June to qualify for the ballot, but the California Supreme Court removed the measure from the November ballot, citing concerns regarding its validity. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with much more of today's 700 Club coming up right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time for your email questions and some honest answers from Pat. We'll start with this one from Kevin. He says, I am finding myself confused about President Trump. So many people, even Christians, put down the president. Am I missing something? He's against abortion. He's trying to protect Americans from harm and is trying to help Israel. Nobody's perfect, but he is trying to live by Christian values. Shouldn't we pray for our leaders, not curse them? Well, absolutely. I tell you, in my lifetime, I don't think there's ever been a president who has embraced evangelical values any more than Donald Trump has. And his judicial selections have been superb, and uh, his tax law and so forth. Uh, he made a mistake in that press conference with Putin and I think the jump on him was a big mistake, but you know, he did correct what he said. So let's face it, uh, you know, he, 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 uh, uh, he corrected it. So let's say, okay, he, he misspoke one time. But other than that, as his record in terms of evangelical initiatives is as good as any president in my lifetime. Yeah, and establishing the embassy in Israel oh, almost right away. Fabulous. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a, he moves boldly, and mm -hmm. that, that's the way it is. But some of the stuff about tariffs, I mean, we've got questions about it. But, you know, you don't have to embrace everything that somebody believes, all of their policies. I mean, only Jesus was perfect. Right. And, you know, so he's a human being, and let's realize that. But he's... As I say, in terms of evangelical initiatives, we have never had a president in my lifetime, and that spans a few decades, that's anywhere close to him in giving uh, the evangelicals what they need. Okay? So true. All right. Belinda says, what does God say in the Bible about capital punishment? Well, what it says is they used to stone people to death. I mean, they killed people for almost anything. You know, they found somebody... Uh, picking up food on the Sabbath day, and they executed him. I mean, there was this one on all the time. And so it was, it was part of the, of, the, of the life of the early uh, Israelites. So what does the Bible say about capital punishment? That's what it says. And then as far as the military, the Apostle Paul said, he that wields a sword doesn't wield it in vain. He's a minister of God uh, to bring judgment. You know, the, you have to have a society in which you put down uh, malefactors. You put down kidnappers and rapists and murderers and thieves and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. You can either put them in prison. But in Israel, I didn't see a whole lot of prisons. They just executed people. Wow. They did. I mean, in the Old Testament, that's yeah. what happened. They got executed. I don't see any, any prison or any penitentiary, I think. The idea of penitentiary is you're supposed to go and be penitent. Mm. But 
all they are right now are breeding grounds for criminals. And uh, I don't know that much rehab that goes on in a, in a, quote, penitentiary. All right? All right. Patrick says, my sister-in-law is a Christian. She has seven kids, and right now she's pregnant. We asked her to tie her tubes, but she says it's a sin. Is it? Pat? Um, I, I, I'm sure that there are people who uh, are dear friends in the Catholic Church who would say it's a sin to interfere, it's a sin to use birth control. They have what they call Catholic roulette. They try to <laughs> time when a woman's the rhythm uh, method. period is coming. Yeah, the rhythm. But uh, I, for one, see nothing wrong with family planning. I think to be able to look after uh, children responsibly is a good thing. Having a huge number of children uh, is, is, well, it, it's your choice. I mean, if you want to have a lot of children, God bless you. But if you don't, if you want to manage them, I don't think there's anything sinful about it. That's my opinion, all right? And if you live on a farm, you need a lot of kids. And that's right. If you need them out there bringing in the crops, I mean, the more children, the better you are. Amen. In, the, in an urban environment, it's a different matter. Right. Well, Carrie says, I need advice on how to handle my wife. I think she's going to divorce me. She's not spirit-filled and is a weak Christian. I'm devastated. I never committed adultery, but I think God is punishing me for my inability to break free from porn. I lost my job. I am financially strapped, but my wife is financially secure. My church of 17 years has shunned me. What can I do? I think there's something beyond what you're telling me in that question. Mm -hmm. um, why does the church shun me? What have you done? Uh, I think the church doesn't know you're watching porn. So that's the secret thing. Uh, what else have you done? Uh, and what's going on with that wife? You know, you want to know how to handle your wife. Um, I tell you, you want to have a long, happy marriage, I'll give you a quick phrase. Whatever makes you happy, dear. <laughs> that's the easiest one, okay? And, you know, he's not providing right now. He's Well, he, he's not providing, and she's, I don't know, the provider. she some money. I, I don't yeah. There's not enough in that question to give you an honest answer, but the biggest thing we do in marriage is to love each other and, and put up with each other's feelings because we are human beings and you don't, you know, the Bible says, be at peace with your wife lest your prayers be hindered. Mm. And that's a real strong thing, okay? Ooh. All right, that's good. All right, this viewer says, I saw a testimony of a man who previously worshiped the devil before he came to Christ. Would the Lord actually forgive someone who made Satan their Lord? Well, of course he would. I mean, again, all manner of sins and blasphemies will be forgiven the sons of man. Uh, if you were worshiping Satan and, and you switch allegiance from Satan to Jesus, that's a good thing. And why would the Lord not accept you? God is very forgiving. That's what, what, but I mean, he's also righteous, and he he has standards, and we cannot impose on those standards. But we come to the Lord and say, God, I am guilty. I have sinned. Please forgive me. And the Lord will say, Of course I forgive you. You know, remember what Jesus said? The man who beat his breath said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's going to go away justified. The man that stands before God and says, look at me, Lord, I, I, I give tithes of everything I've got, and I'm such a good person, and I, I help little ladies across the street, and I'm a deacon in the church, and the God says, you know, come off it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not buying that. I, I want humility, not pride. All right. Amen. All right. Thanks, Pat. Great answers and great questions. Well, up next, a woman does a double take when her doctor gives her the results of a follow-up MRI. They say you have, your surgeries was successful. And I said, you know, I did not have surgery. I've not had surgery on my neck. Watch how a supernatural surgery sets this woman free from debilitating pain. Well, a few years ago, a car crash left Brenda Wade in a world of pain. Today, Brenda's 100% healed. She received a supernatural surgery while watching The 700 Club. On July 15, 2015, Brenda Sipes Wade was getting on the interstate on-ramp to go home when she saw the cars in front of her had stopped. I put on my brakes real quick and I had no brakes. 
I just, I thought, oh, I'm going to crash into him, and I did. I told my car, and uh, the next thing I remember, because I did hit my head against the steering wheel, it's a guy helping me out of the car to get into an ambulance. Uh, wasn't, no, well, a couple minutes after that till my neck really started hurting. After an MRI and x-rays confirmed she had no broken bones, her emergency room doctors gave her a neck brace and sent her home. Afterwards, she was in constant pain. That's the only way I could keep from the headache and the back of the neck hurting was wearing the neck brace. I finally got it situated when I went to bed at night to where I could wear the neck brace while I was in bed. For two months, she went to her chiropractor three times a week, but the pain would not go away. It's the simplest of things, hardwood floors, sweeping. So I would say anything involving your shoulders, movement of, it, of your head, neck, and shoulders that I had difficulty with. On September 4th, she was at home watching the 700 Club. They were doing prayer, and I was sitting back over here in my recliner, and I had my hand like this on my neck because it was really bothering me. He had a word of knowledge. He said, There's someone you're laying your right hand on the back of your neck. You've had a severe injury to the right side. Very difficult for you to turn your, your neck. You have recurring headaches from it, recurring pain shooting down into your right shoulder. God's healed you. It described exactly how I felt and where I had my hand on my neck and so forth. And I said, that's for me, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I started just shaking my head around, up and down, every direction. He just set you free from that. Uh, just begin to move your neck. Uh, do what you couldn't do before. Stand up, move your shoulder, move your neck all the way around. Realize there's no more pain. You have been set free. Two weeks later, her doctor called her with the results from a follow-up MRI. They say you have, your surgery was successful. And I said, you know I did not have surgery. I've not had surgery on my neck. He said, well, you had a surgeon that's not of this earth. I said, you're right, you're right. I said, I knew I was healed. Now she's back to doing her needlepoint and other hobbies she couldn't do before. It was definitely a miracle, definitely a miracle. I mean, you know, I'm a, it just was a miracle, simple as that. When it shows you've had surgery and you haven't, <laughs> it was all healed. It was just so miraculous, it really was. A surgery not of this earth. Yeah. Is there anything too hard for God? That Isn't is that amazing. Horrible? Can you imagine though, you can't sleep. I mean, that's horrible. So I mean, horrible. There's no position in, in the bed where you're not in agony. I mean, to be delivered from that is wonderful. Listen, here's something, Wendy. Uh, for weeks, Janet, who lives in Abilene, Texas, suffered from something called vertigo. And she was watching the 700 Club in May when you, you said somebody has vertigo. You're very dizzy and unstable. God's healing you. Janet said, that's for me. Should I take it by faith? The vertigo is completely gone. And what a miracle. What <laughs> do you have? Lord. Okay. Karen of Dallas, Georgia, she suffered for 10 years with bleeding due to colon issues. However, she still believed God could heal her. Karen was watching the 700 Club, and she heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, praying for someone's colon. By faith, she claimed her healing the very next day. The bleeding completely stopped after 10 years. Praise the Lord. Listen, God is able. Folks, God is able. I was praying today. I said, Lord, show me yourself. Let me know your power. You realize this tiny little earth we're on and how great God is, and he created all the universe? I mean, what is such a big deal about healing a cancer? Well, why do you think it's so strange that God would do something miraculous and fix somebody's neck mm. or, or cancer or vertigo or whatever? So we want to pray for you right now, and we're going to believe God. And I want you to know nothing is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So we're going to join hands. We're going to believe God for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we speak the word and we ask for healing. We ask for miracle power in Jesus' name. Touch people in this audience. Wendy, what do you have? Yeah, there's someone you are, 
you are just in fear right now. And God is saying to you, do not fear. Trust me. Wait on me. And I'm going to work this out. So do not fear in Jesus' name. Uh, you've had a serious ulcer, a bleeding ulcer, and there's been a lot of pain and nausea and bleeding, and you're just crying out to God right now. Claudia, I believe the name is, in Jesus' name, be made whole. Someone, you just saw this piece with, about Brenda's neck, and you've had, um, it's not so much your neck, but your back, and you are asking for the same miraculous Amen. surgery to take place, and God is saying yes today. Your spine is being completely healed. Just Maybe receive the it. May the of the Lord touch you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Amen. And amen. Well, thanks for being with us. We leave you with this power minute from Joshua. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, Tomorrow, we're going to sit down exclusively with the Israeli ambassador to the UN uh, on Friday and uh, on that program. So until then, this is Pat Robertson with Wendy and all of us here. We'll see you at our next program. God bless you.